Welcome to In the Landscape, a podcast on all things landscape design and care related with your hosts, Kate and Charles Sadler. Welcome to In the Landscape. It's another gorgeous day and Mm -hmm. we're excited to be here in studio, which is a break for us from being in the landscape. (laughs) (laughs) But we do have windows in the studio, so we look out on a landscape that's never far from our minds. Mm -hmm. I'm Kate Sadler, and I'm here with my co-host, Charles Sadler. Hi, Charles. Good to be here. Yeah, it is good to be here. We're excited to bring you another topic on, as I say in the intro, all things landscape design and care related. Mm -hmm. And as we get to know our listeners better and we take a look at which episodes are popular and which questions come into us, we're able to tailor the content of the show even better to what we hope is appealing to our listeners. And a lot of the topics that are popular are, of course, the basics. (laughs) We've already (laughs) talked about how how do we keep our hydrangeas blooming by pruning them in the correct way? How do we prune effectively? How do we plant effectively? Good design leads to good results. Yeah, all those gardening tips are always really popular. Everybody, Everybody could use more Well, most of us could use more information about how to garden and what we're doing in the garden. But then there's this other concept, as you just mentioned, the design principles that go into good landscape design and helping our listeners at home in their own landscapes design more effectively or creatively, Mm -hmm. kind of unleash that side of things. And we hope that today's episode will be a step in that direction as well. Today, we're going to talk about water features. And this is a bit of a an add on to an episode we did early on. And we hope if you haven't heard it yet, you'll go back and give it a listen. That's our episode on irrigation. The title is Waterworks. Because the harnessing of water and the way we think about the use of water in our landscape is really important at a functional level. To keep plants alive, to keep water away from things that could become deteriorated, whether it's architecture, plants receive too much water, it could be detrimental paving, hardscaping with too much water, then freezing and thawing. It doesn't take much water to see just how powerful water is. I mean, it's this great shaper of massive landscapes like the Grand Canyon, and it can have those effects in your own backyard. Actually, recently I flew over, coming back from the east to Texas, I flew over the Mississippi River, which often, if you pay attention you watch the flight tracker, you can find it and it is magnificent and how it, there's lots of S curves. Like, you know, it really, it meanders from an airplane, from whatever that would be like seven to 10 miles above it. You see how it is not a straight line (laughs) and it's massive. It's the width of it. Massive. Even from an airplane, really. There are a couple of rivers where I thought, is that the Mississippi? And then when I saw the real Mississippi, (laughs) that is definitely (laughs) no mistaking. No mistaking it. So water is, it's vital and it's something that we use as a necessity in the landscape. And it is also this great, soothing, restorative feature, I think, for many of us. Right. It's really soothing. Always enjoyed visiting lakeside homes or when we were living on the Hudson River, being able to see not just a vista, but a vista with water in it. I think speaks to some really primal need um, to know that we're close to a source that is an essential part of our survival. Mm-hmm. Perhaps, perhaps. And then it's reflective qualities too. Absolutely. Whether it's Light, a, yeah. a wild landscape, whether it's a constructed design landscape, it's really special when the sky is reflected in it. It can be done in an intentional way or if it's a natural landscape, that's quite powerful. It can bring light into the ground plane where the sky is in front of you. (laughs) That's a cool concept. And also reminds me that there's yet another sense that water can stimulate, which is our our hearing, Mm. that the sound of water is often used in, you know, white noise machines and um, or sort of like meditation (laughs) fountains, that the sound of water is a really powerful, has a powerful effect on us Mm -hmm. in the landscape. And can even, as we mentioned in our screening episode, have the impact of helping keep out noises that are less desirable for us. So today's episode is all about water features. And so we're taking a little step away from the concept of irrigation and what water can do for the plants in our landscape, both positive and negative. And we're going to talk about the design of water features and Mm -hmm. how to do this in your own yard. 
we'll get a little bit of the history because we know that's an important part of informing what we do. So Charles, you did some research and was there something you wanted to share with us about the history of water features and how they've evolved? Well, it goes back, like we're finding, you know, just from my own experience and also as we, we report this, we're reporting the same information often where early gardens go back to Persia and China. So some of the early water features go back to that period too. I guess we've visited a beautiful, a type of a Chinese garden called a scholar's garden, where it's often, it'd often be urban, walled garden, and water would often be a feature. And that was actually, the garden is actually located in the city of Portland in Oregon. We didn't see this in China proper, which would be really exciting. And I'm right. sure we'll, we'll make it out there someday to check out some, some authentic scholar gardens in that country. But this was one that was done exceptionally well in, in the city of Portland. So mm-hmm. some people know about their Japanese garden. I don't know if this walled Chinese scholar garden is as well known. And its name is, the way I would pronounce it is Lan Su, L-A-N, and then another word, S-U. And that's a very special, there's all kind of seasonal, it's very well programmed. So I would imagine it's related to the Chinese calendar. Lots of events, often there's some at night, you know, with lanterns and then various blooming periods of flowers. It's I'll work into its programming. So we go back to like an, an interesting date. We learned that prior to the industrial age, water features, it was from diverting a river or a stream. And we think of, we've actually mentioned in our irrigation episode, we mentioned some European sort of masters of diverting water. You mentioned Capability Brown, who was an English landscape designer. Mm-hmm. And, um, and his first name is actually... Lancelot. So oh. your name was Lancelot. <laughs> and um, like the term, cap- we probably have said this before, but capability, when he would meet a client and they would say, okay, so I, here's the raw landscape. What do you think? And he would say, it has capability. Oh, and that's where I came from. That's nice. where his nickname, he was, he was an optimist. <laughs> oh, that's fun. I like that. And then we also mentioned Andre Lenotre, who was the designer ultimately of the, the gardens at Versailles, which are certainly famous for their water features. So what you're saying essentially that is that these landscape designers, among others in Europe and other parts of the world, were having to rely on tricks that would enable gravity and the impulse of water to flow downhill to flow in the ways that they designed. So there was still an, an immense amount of engineering involved. There were, I think, even as I understand it, maybe like mechanical wheels that would help kind of move stuff upward, but they had to be manually operated in a way right correct to, to some extent yeah, the, there's an old story at i believe it's at versailles so the king would more or less as i understood he would want to show off that this incredible powerful water fountains so there wasn't enough water pressure to have all the fountains running so if you were visiting let's say there's a party of 10 people and he's walking the grounds the gardeners would be standing at the wheel holding the pressure and they'd be looking at the fountain and it would be going 45 feet in the air. It'd be amazing. People, this incredible power, which was like a symbol of the king's power. That's what he wanted to imply. And then they would say, oh, now we're going to go to the next one. And they turn the corner. The gardeners would be running to turn the water off of that fountain. So there'd be enough pressure for the next one. Mm. And they did that sequentially, you know, maybe for hours. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because water flows so easily these days in our modern faucets that it's easy to forget that what you're doing ultimately is managing water pressure and the ability to push water up against the pull of gravity so that it comes out in the way that you desire, <laughs> which is essentially what we're doing both with irrigation and in this case with water features. So now there was a, an important development in history. Right. So 1760, when you think that's you know, the date that they that the industrial age began is what, uh, what I found. Which we'll be honest with our listeners. We get, we got from Wikipedia <laughs> That's right. and we do, <laughs> we do some serious scholarly research and we care very much about the journals that are out there. We read them. We love them. We cite <laughs> authors when we can. Every once in a while, Wikipedia is a great resource and certainly a go-to. Yeah, it's always um, good to confirm that. Yeah, it's good know. to confirm. Yeah. <laughs> right. So 1760 is when the water pump, well, is the dawn of the industrial age. And so the water pump, that allowed you to have water pressure without diverting a stream or a river. Wow. So like a lot of developments from that era, if we kind of think in the positive terms, in a way democratized the ability to have 
water at your disposal. Maybe it Mm -hmm. took a little bit of time, but slowly things like indoor plumbing and even the irrigation that we use in our gardens and eventually the ability to have your own fountain, which would almost be unheard of in a certain era of human history. Like kings and queens that had, or maybe on a civic level, the community had water to provide, but an individual wouldn't have that luxury. Yes. And often for the sake of safety that in, of course, when we're talking about water, this concept that you could have this vital natural resource just sort of flowing as the king of France did in his gardens sort of belies the fact that there were certainly people in crowded cities that were getting waterborne illnesses Mm -hmm. all the time. And so you had maybe civic fountains, which were these great water features that were being developed essentially to provide safe drinking water to the citizens of the city. And that's still when you do, I mean, when I watch program, that's still an issue of people dying yeah. in, in lesser developed countries. Absolutely. And it's an epidemic because it's waterborne. Yeah. Because of poor sanitation is that's the, the crux of it. So it's, um, you know, sometimes we say on this program that we, a lot of what we do in the landscape is about being mindful, sort of conscientious about the environment or conscientious about the natural resources that we're using. And so it's, um, not to make it a grim reminder, but it's just, uh, it sort of honors the fact that we can have a water feature in our garden today. If we Mm -hmm. think about how precious a resource it really is. It's interesting because we in our townhouse in New York lived near a really important water feature. I don't know what you call it, but it was, it was a a feature that was underground and extended. Right. Roughly 40 miles from Croton to, to like midtown Manhattan. And so this was an actual aqueduct, which, of course, can be found throughout history in other regions of the world, this management of water that we're talking about. But before we get on to designing new features, it was really remarkable to live near this structure. As I understand it, you can take a tours. Tour. There, of- are, there are weirs where it's so there are sections if you wanted to shut down the water. Right. Yes. I find the thought. A little scary of going in there, right, taking going a boat along. But ultimately, just this this slight change of grade. So again, maintaining water pressure. All it takes is a little bit of gravity, and you've got water on the move across forty miles. Eventually, it would cross into Manhattan, result in going across the High Bridge, which, which is, they've recently restored, which is right? very dramatic. Which is a very tall bridge, yeah. which is civic, incredible architecture, engineering. You know, it's. It's beautiful to look at. Yes. And it crosses from the Bronx, as I understand it, into Manhattan. Right. I mean, we've walked across it, but everyone. You know, and there's a tall tower sure there. I think the tower is being renovated, but. Yeah. So it's this celebration. Well, then in Manhattan and Central Park, there's Bethesda Plaza. That's like the goddess of water, which mm-hmm. would have been. They built Central Park in the mid 1800s. There was not good sanitation. Mm-hmm. People were dying from. Mm. So clean water was the most rarefied, special commodity. And so this water that flows through this Croton, the quote, quote, Croton aqueduct would eventually wind up where in New York City? Well, it's the current, the central library is the, that property, which is like 42nd Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. And that used to be a giant reservoir. Right. So now it's Bryant Park and it was an elevated. So imagine a very tall walled reservoir, which was a good part of the whole city block. And people would... You'd wear your Sunday finest and people would promenade around that probably after all the churches and synagogues and other institutions on Fifth Avenue. Mm. So, yeah, it was quite a special. Again, it was like a celebration water special. It's rare. It's essential for life. And And that's maybe why it's so restorative that it's it links us to that necessity. There are a lot of great for folks who are New York history buffs. There's some great podcasts out there on New York history. So I encourage you, if you found us through the gardening angle, but you'd like more history, get out there and check them out. One in particular, the Bowery Boys is one that I've listened to. I remember you saying that. Living in New York City. So much fun because there's a lot of history related to some of these old reservoirs and things like that. So that brings us to the modern era, essentially, now that we've sort of covered how This development of being able to pump water is what makes water features possible today. And as we look at the different types of water features that one could put in the modern garden, that pump is an important component, something that without the visual aid, we won't be able to get into too much detail here about how you would put one of those together. But there are, I'm sure, how-tos online. So 
who's doing some great work with these water features in the modern era? Well, let's see, like, a, you know, for my landscape um, architecture training, history was a big part of that. And a legendary landscape architect, uh, Lawrence Halprin, and the Cultural Landscape Foundation has, has in-depth biographies about him and other places. So he lived 1916 to 2009, so he just pretty recently passed away. I would call him a modernist, so, you know, very contemporary. And he was, I think of him as Mr. Waterfall. <laughs> so growing up, I grew up in Rochester, New York. People often call up upstate, but it's really like central New York, because you can go even further up to the Adirondacks. <laughs> <laughs> so right in Rochester, in Manhattan Square Park, was uh, one of his parks where it's very, if you can imagine, an abstraction of a mountain waterfall. So there's all different levels and different different tiers and, and and instead of being made out of rock it's made out of concrete and that was his sort of signature style that he would repeat throughout i don't know if he worked abroad he definitely worked throughout the united states and so another special one is in san francisco the uh, levi like levi strauss campus called levi's plaza that's more of a stream that runs through it there may be a, a larger waterfall i can't recall his maybe his, his largest, most significant one is Freeway Park in Seattle, which is a park that's over a freeway. So the the sound is a white noise feature. He did the the FDR Presidential Memorial in Washington D.C. And that's a series of basically four. I think it's four rooms, outdoor rooms, and so water plays a very big role. And that's his sort of signature style. With his water features are often quite loud, where it's rushing water, and it's psychological sort of all-encompassing you forget the outside world you're brings you right into that moment yeah the ocean has that effect when you hear those crashing waves it's that it helps sort of clear the mind i think because it is so all-encompassing and i think i don't know if it was that levi's plaza but i i do recall growing up in the san francisco bay area some really unique water features and then Unfortunately, the debate about whether to continue to run them as the state was facing, I think, both uh. power and water issues at certain points mm. in, the, in, you know, the last 20 or 30 years or so. Again, water being a natural resource is also at times a scarce resource. So that all comes into play when it comes to designing them for civic spaces. You know, and then as we get to bringing this back into your own property, your own residence those same principles apply. If if it's too difficult, <laughs> things go unused. If it requires lots of cleaning or maintenance, that's really like a factor in the design process. What's like what is reasonable that could be maintained? And we were also recently on our drive south in Knoxville, I think it was, and we walked along the riverfront. And we mentioned this in our road trip episode. But there was also a, a park along the riverfront and part of it had this waterfall feature and mm. there were families playing in it and cooling off. And so it was really, again, this open space for people to partake of this soothing, relaxing, cooling feature during the peak of summer because it was the middle of August. Right. And, and to, you know, grant access to water to, to groups of people in a way that the whole community can appreciate it is mm -hmm. a really neat feature of kind of civic water projects. That can, it really can be democratic. And those features from a safety and landscape architecture point of view, when there's a fountain that comes up in the water, it goes back to the ground plane, but there's no pool. So you don't need a lifeguard. You couldn't drown. I mean, it would be very difficult to drown and that, so you don't need supervision. So that's really and innovation, just even in the last 20 years, I would guess, to have an open water feature that the public can partake in. There's a beautiful one, beautiful one in Millennium Park in Chicago, which is, it's so democratic. It's so beautiful to see people of many races, every economic group, people from that are just visiting people that live there. It's, they're all splashing together and it's safe. There's no supervision needed. So that's, mm. that's, that's quite a, innovation for that to happen because <laughs> i don't know if our listeners can relate to that feeling of coming up on a gorgeous fountain that's in a public space and it's got the edge that you could sit on so that's wonderful and the sound is going but it's a hot day and you'd love to get in and just wade right. <laughs> around but you're not allowed it's you know it's off limits to getting into the water and you know for 
practical reasons for, you know, that sort of water feature, I'm sure. So as we're observing, it's a great innovation and Mm -hmm. resource for communities to have splash pads and waterfalls and these accessible water It's often divided by age, which I think is like a dog park. There's a small dog and a big dog for for the water. It's the splash. Some of the more larger communities, that's so there's for very for toddlers and then for children, let's say grade school and then a full size pool. To sort of segment it. Mm. So if we're looking at our own landscapes and we want to start to incorporate water features in our own space, what are some options that we can consider? What are what are some things that we need to know before we dive in? <laughs> <laughs> With any introduction, it's always like to use the design process. And like you could go through it in minutes. It doesn't have to be a long and drawn out, but more or less like what's the program? What's the goal? Is it maybe it's to hear water, to come home after work or after a day of however one spends one's day, and to hear water. So if they hear water, there's lots of ways to achieve that. If it's to cool off, then that's that's a whole other. So let's see the location of it. If something is difficult, people don't tend to use it. So if you have an herb garden, it should be right near your kitchen where you can walk out and cut some herbs. So the water feature, it should be a place where you could enjoy it. So that's quite close. If it's a townhouse, apartment, multifamily, like whatever the scale of it, it should be convenient. And so it could be something as simple as a bird bath. Right. Which provides a little bit of motion in the garden. It gives the a little bit of habitat. It, it animates does not, it too. And it doesn't require the, ultimately it doesn't require the pump action that we had talked about. Oh, right. Is it still water? Like at a restaurant, is it still or bubbly? <laughs> <laughs> right. So a bird bath is a great idea. That's you put a bird bath and you get birds. There's all different scales. It could be very modern, contemporary, or traditional, classic. There are, I guess, maybe starting with the simpler. I was just in the in the Hamptons in the Long Island for work, and I love visiting nurseries and garden centers. And so, and the same here in Texas, a it's more or less a large garden urn, which has recirculating water. So it's a fountain, but it's like a freestanding unit. This one that I saw at one nursery. There was a plate on top and then it was hollow on the inside. So the water was bubbling up in a fountain. And when it, then when it spilled over inside the urn, you could hear it echo, which I had not heard that, which was, I had not seen that before or heard that. And that was quite nice. It really drew you in. So an element like that, you'd fill it up and you'd plug it in. And so you need electricity generally for that. Some of the very small ones could be battery operated or there's solar occasionally. Those don't, don't tend to be as effective, but I'm just thinking about the bird bath, which is still water, and at least in regions where mosquitoes are prevalent, is that everywhere in the world? It might be everywhere in the world. I'm no, I'm not a mosquito expert, but I know they've been in most places I've lived. You don't want to have too much standing water that's left untreated for things like mosquitoes. Then, of course, you have algaes and other water plants that can. I guess, grow and sometimes get out of control. Do you happen to know with the moving water, do you have to treat it or are there different standards? Well, let's, you know, for a smaller recirculating water vessel, I'm very familiar with those at, at clients' homes. My sense is it's, it's not a problem. So it's, it's moving. So I think that discourages insects or growth. I wouldn't drink the water. It still might have something growing in it. <laughs> uh, but if it was periodically cleaned out and I think the amount of sunlight it receives and if if litter is falling in it, such as leaves and other things, that would affect it. And so some of that adds to what you were talking about. If it's not easy, we don't tend to do it or use it. And so you may want to think about where to place your water feature based on things like leaf litter and sun if you don't want to be cleaning it constantly. And then maintenance too is yeah. where you place it. Are you going to be able to dump it out, to refill it readily? And of course, it's interesting because one of the things that accompanies water features in many cases, especially in beautiful Japanese gardens or places where they have the resources to facilitate them, fish are a big feature. Mm -hmm. And the movement of the water is actually necessary for them in some of these closed pond systems. Right. right. Yeah, but I spent a fair amount of time in San Antonio. And so as you're walking, there's the River Walk, which is this real cultural destination icon great restaurants. You can do a boat tour. And so there are plaques as you're walking through this river walk, which is it's below street level. So there's bridges over it. 
and it's it's more or less like a wildlife feel to it. There's lots of bald cypress. It's it's quite a special place. There's a lot of activities, but it all works. <laughs> and so they have a plaque that says there are many waterfalls. I mean, probably I would say every few hundred yards, there's a waterfall which you pass. It's like spilling from a wall and it's traveling across the path or a bridge and then it's going in into this into this canal more or less. And they explain it's actually practical. It's to aerate the water for the fish. So it's also, it's an aesthetic amenity. It's beautiful, but it's on, it's a, on a very practical level. That's what it's for. So I suppose in order to get the water moving, and this was, again, the reason the industrial age made <laughs> mechanical pumps possible, was the introduction of the mechanism, which in, in our modern era includes an attachment to some electrical source, I would mm-hmm. imagine. Right. So this is something maybe you could install yourself, but electricity and water don't go well together. And so you want to be very careful as you're kind of selecting how you're going to install it, whether you want to do it yourself or maybe enlist somebody to help you. And, you know, maybe even think of a water source that doesn't require electricity if that is, is a component that's too complicated. Mm-hmm. Although they have, um, I've seen solar pumps oh, that you right. can kind of, so you have the still water feature, a little pond or something, and then you place these on top. And when the sun hits them, there's not a ton of power from the few that I've encountered. Maybe there's some that are better than others. If any listeners have a recommendation for one that mm-hmm. really goes full power when the sun is out, but it is fun to have the sun kind of participating in this movement pumping of the water. When we're planning our water feature, you mentioned the vases that you can use. So you can create it out of something that is structural to begin with. But a lot of them are, in my experience, from what I've seen, sort of mimicking nature, which means you need to think about moving in, maybe moving dirt out and moving other features in. There, are, So there's like a freestanding water feature, which is quite basic. That can be very satisfying. There are beautiful, many beautiful modern landscapes where it's, it's a wall feature and then water that spills from the wall and then a pool beneath it. So that's not mimicking nature, but that's still very satisfying. Then there's water features that have a naturalistic aesthetic where you're mimicking a pond or a stream. I remember from my Japanese garden training in history, the most advantageous way to see water, a stream, and you can when you're out in nature walking, you can see if this is true. <laughs> you want the water to be approaching you. And so when, it, when it's going away from you, it's not as appealing. And mm. I've, when you're walking in nature, you can see this. When it's coming towards you, there's movement and it's, it's dropping in elevation. And it's catching light and you can see the drop, even if it's just a couple of inches at a time. When it's going away from you, it's not nearly as satisfying. Mm. And, you know, there's all kinds of technical reasons, I'm sure. But I'm sure there's more of an, an element of uncertainty where, like, as you mentioned, even if it's a small drop, if you can't see the other side of it, right. then things feel maybe a little more out of control if right. it's rushing away from it, you. It's not uh, when it's coming towards you, it's obvious. Well, that's a really interesting principle. Well, here, like in Texas with bayous, that's, it's so slow moving. You can't, I can't really tell which way it's moving. Mm. It looks like still water. Mm. It's not, it's moving. It's imperceptible, but it is moving. <laughs> Now, as we're observing, your water feature is going to require structure and electricity and water. One will need to think about the maintenance of it, whether it's, you know, extensive or not, not so great. But this also lends itself to the idea of this other type of feature that you can introduce. So my sister's backyard has an area that is a bit shady. It doesn't have anything in it. And you suggested actually that maybe they could put in a dry stream bed. Oh, right. I remember that was that was a low spot in a Japanese garden. One term is a dry stream. Dry, it's like I think it's karasan sui is is the word. And so a Japanese scholar could correct me if I didn't say that right. So imagine you construct out of gravel and st- various sized stones and boulders a stream or a waterfall, but there's no water. People can even look this up. When it's done well, it's very convincing. It mm. feels like water. Mm. And then there are, there are plants that mimic irises and other with that vertical sword like foliage that really if you have a dry stream and you have aquatic plants next to it which don't require 
to be wet that like an iris can grow without water, without being saturated. It really feels, it's very compelling. So for a shady garden area, that a, a dry stream can really be a great solution. That's excellent. And I suppose, I mean, if you did get a little bit of rain at times, if you're thinking not just about introducing a water feature that is is reliant on excess water being brought in and manipulated, but you craft the, the landscape so that it makes the most of the rainy season, mm-hmm. you get a little bit of rushing water when it's appropriate, then you're really mimicking nature, which is sort of making, you know, a lot of water features crop up when it's really rainy that maybe aren't there or present or visible during the dry season. Right. Which is, that's more or less what a rain garden is, where it looks like a dry stream. And then when, when it's inundated, when there's a storm, it'd be full of water. So maybe the final season that would apply to some of our listeners would be winter. And of course, there's a water feature that you mentioned called an ice wall. Oh, right. That was the landscape architect, Michael Van Valkenburg. I think early in his career, that was one of his specialties. And so it's, imagine a, a a masonry wall that has a water feature where it's weeping water. It's water's falling very gradually. And if that occurs in the winter, you've got ice like you'd see in many regions of the country where there's a natural ice wall. People do ice climbing. So a feature like that can really, it can animate a winter landscape. And water fountains, of course, ponds can, that have a recirculating water feature. There's a little more to it, but that can keep a pond open. The water can be utilized by birds and you know it's it's keeps air circulating great so any final thoughts as we kind of wrap up this this brief episode on water features there's always more to say there's always more to see of course uh look for us on social media and we'll try to post photos of great water features that we've seen ideas for what you can plant in a water garden just conceptualizing where it's going to go and how it's going to be put in the landscape is an important part and a way to start right so let's see making it convenient to the house. It can be very decorative. Visiting nurseries, garden centers. There's lots of online resources. Here in Texas, there's one that's nearby. I think it's called Nelson Water Garden. You know, that's a great place to visit and to, and to see water features in action. Just a reference, the American Society of Landscape Architects, their annual meeting, I think it was 2005, they had a panel and they talked all about water, water features. And uh uh, John Loomis, who's a landscape architect from SWA, he was quoted, and he's, which I think is, this is apropos, <laughs> less is more typically holds true with water features, unless if you go the more route, that more is masterfully executed. So simple, keep it simple, but do it well. And so whatever that budget might, be, some of these recirculating water features where it's like an urn that's maybe 30 inches, 40 inches tall. Those are generally like in the hundreds of dollars here in the U.S. So that's not inexpensive, but something like that could be very satisfying. And then where you're installing a water feature, that's like in the thousands. And then when you get up to a pond, that's like in the tens of thousands. You know, that's really, and then there's every scale of that, there's more maintenance. So the, the simpler ones, well, less maintenance. And then the more complicated the water features, then you're really hiring someone to do the maintenance. And that's all considerations. (laughs) Great. So we've talked about irrigation now on this show. We've talked about water features themselves. Again, we uh, will likely branch out into water plants when we have an opportunity to circle back on this topic. Water, really important to our lives, to our landscapes, and uh, great to get a little bit more time with this topic here on In the Landscape. So we look forward to hearing from you. You can check out our page kinggardeninc.com forward slash in dash the dash landscape. And that's a great way to connect with us on all fronts, social media, uh, read our show notes, check out our transcripts. That's sort of one-stop shopping for finding Mm -hmm. us. So uh, we look forward to seeing you. We hope you get out in the landscape yourself sometime soon. Thank you. Thanks for joining (laughs) us. Thanks for listening. See you next week.